Koithi Arapuru Sounds E ngā reo, e ngā mana, raurang atira mā, tēnā koutou katoa. Tālo falava, mā lō e lelei, ni sambula vinaka, whakalo valahe atu, tālo hani, no a ia i Māori, kam na Māori, a fio mai, maliu mai. It's a sacred sound, and it's a tapu every time you hear this sound. It's actually used to clear the cosmos, to clear that space, to make it a safe space for all of us before the entertainment follows. These instruments are our Morse code or our mobile phones back in the days to send messages to the next village. Pate is the vibration of, it's the beat of the heart. It's the beating of the heart. It's the vibration of the heart. That's what Pate means. It's soothing, it's therapeutic. It is uh, hypnotic. You hypnotize, in other words, you hypnotize a king with this. It was actually a wavelength to connect the mortals, the peoples, to the beyond. You're with the podcast series Sounds of the Moana, Episode 2, The Origin of Sounds, for Sound Centre for New Zealand Music, Toi te ara puoro, ko tau ili ili alfa maiava ahau. For thousands of years, stories have travelled throughout Moana Nuiya Kiwa or Oceania of the waka, the double-hulled canoe. Traditionally, the creation of a waka involved the collective efforts of a community, master carvers, chanters, weavers, priests and priestesses. Each had their own role to make sure the vaka was constructed and assembled by the descendants of each god. And when the moment arrived to set sail, the passengers on the waka also held specific roles found in everyday life across the Moana. The workers, the servants, the chiefs, the orators, the family unit, and of course, the musicians and their sounds. The beginning of the 20th century saw the last chapter of colonial rule within the Pacific Islands. Christianity had already taken a strong foothold, but this didn't stop the ancestral desire to navigate further into the Moana in search of a better life. The post-war demands for workers in Aotearoa, New Zealand, began a migration period that echoes through the country's social and sonic landscape today. These navigators brought with them not only their hopes, dreams and families, but also reminders of home. Those reminders were kept alive through stories, chants, songs and musical instruments. In this podcast... We hold talanoa or conversations around the origins of musical instruments found across the Great Moana. First, we'll hear stories about the most sacred of instruments in the Moana Nui, the conch shell, known as the Boo in the Cook Islands and the Four Four in Samoa. We will stay in the Cook Islands for their infamous drums, the Bate. And finally, will enter the world of dreams with the nose flute, known as the Fangufangu in Tonga and Vivo Koe in the Cook Islands. Now, it's important to note that during the time these stories originated, Tangata Moana or the people of the Pacific existed in a world where the spiritual realm and that of the mortals were one and the same. So although we refer to them as stories today, they should really be thought of as realities for the indigenous worlds of which they are from. The ultimate origin story of the Pacific is one that should be familiar to those who grew up in Aotearoa. The separation of Ranginui, or Father Sky, and Papatuanuku, Mother Earth, by their Tamariki, or children, it's no surprise then that the creation story from Te Ao Māori is shared in the Cook Islands, although with a few remixes. To take us back into the beginning, 
we hear from Ma'aramaeva, a Cook Islands learning specialist at Tamaki Paengahira, or Auckland War Memorial Museum. In the Cook Islands version, Father Sky is Rangiatea or Atea, and Mother Earth is Papatitimu. Ma'ara introduces the children who plan a separation of sonic proportion using the conch shell or bu. Tangaro, all things to do with the ocean. Uh, Rakamama, all things to do with uh, the weather, the winds. Tutavake, all things to do with conflicts or conflict resolution. Tane, all things to do with vegetation and plants. These were the Atua Tamariki. They were enclosed in between Ate Rangiate and Papate Tumu. So they led by Tane, they planned to revolt, to push those parents apart. The way they pushed those parents apart was one of the ways anyway, uh, through shouting, through song, through blowing, amongst many things, things from their mouth. Poo. So that's the mythological origin of the poo. So there you go. The poo actually is a divine gift straight from Tangaroa, the ocean, the garden of the ocean. So then the poo, being a child of Tangaroa, then goes all to that origins when uh, Rangi Atea and Papa Tetumu were separated. So the sounds that was blown or sang during the separation is of that of that. So it's a very, very, very important. So again, one of the early instruments that was known uh, throughout the Pacific, in fact, throughout the world. And most importantly, as people of the Moana, as people sailing through the Moana, uh, f- uh, people uh, fishing and collecting from the Moana, they would have seen this all the time, every time. So they would have used that. The meat from this is even more beautiful. And the Cook Islands, what are some of the main purpose of this, other than calling? Did you use it uh, for entertainment or is it purely ceremonial? Both uh, uh, for entertainment, especially the sacred part of the entertainment. For example, like the Turo, the calling, you know, that's, that's before. So the, the Turo is the sacred part. So the entertainment thereafter is the secular part. The pool really is... Other than for calling, it's actually used to clear the cosmos, to clear the space, whether the air or whatever, of negativities, to make it a safe, uh, a safe space for all of us before the entertainment follows. That's the purpose of it. Whilst the Cook Islands associate the pool or the conch shell to the beginning of time, Samoa's story of this conch shell, the 4-4, involves famine, sacrifice, jealousy, sorcery, and murder. To tell this whangongo or fable is Leunga Ape Tawaana Ata Sofara. Leunga is a Samoan orator, chief, and respected knowledge holder of Samoan traditions. He teaches Samoan language and history with the Pacific Education Center, an organization dedicated to revitalizing languages and cultures of Tangata Moana. So I remember the, the old Fangongo of the story of the 404, where the two sisters, Sinai Sena and Sinai Ofu, uh, daughters of the Tuimanua or the Tangaloa at the time. Sinai Senga and Sinai Ofu were princesses daughters of the king of Manua. This was at a time of famine around the Manua Islands. And they hear of this great uh, son of the Tuifiti in the east, the most eastern islands, that he is a hero and a warrior and he's a manaya and he's a, you know, a very handsome man. And the two sisters decided who will be the one who will be traveling over because they know there will be obstacles along the way. Um, it was time of sorcerers and, you know, of the demons of Samoa at the time. So it was a very unsafe trip to to journey to the place of the Tuifiti's son. 
So Sinai Ofu and Sinai Senga decided that one will go and one will stay back to look after their land and their elderly father. Sinai Ofu went over and um, married this uh, Lawama, the son of uh, the Tuifiti. But Sinai Ofu's marriage to Tuifiti caused some political issues and jealousies around the islands. And there were concubines and some other great women of the Pacific who liked to marry uh, Lawama, the son of the Tuifiti. So there were uh, plans to murder and and take out uh, Sinai Ofu from having this marriage, but the marriage carried on and, and born so many children. Sinai Senga had been waiting for so long and, you know, the famine was getting worse. So... The Taulaitu and the sorceress, or Daila Mutu, of the Tuimanu. The Taulaitu, or witch doctor, and Naila Mutu, or sorceress of the Tuimanua, served as messengers between the Sina sisters. One of the sorcerers told Sina Isenga, Your sister has married and made good for herself. Sina Iofu is married now to Lawama, the son of the Tuifiti, and she has decided to bring you some food back here to your family in Manua. But unfortunately, uh, the henchmen, the Shahs, do not uh, approve. So they uh, plot to murder uh, Sina and the children without uh, Lawama, the son of the Tuifiti, knowing. So Sina Isenga found out of what, what was going to happen, and she cried and stood there, and the beach and decided if she's going to go herself. But it was too late. Sina Iofu and her children were, were murdered by these shaman and they were thrown into the, the vortex. So their bodies were dismembered by the strong currents and, uh, and uh, rocks and um, it is believed that from there their bones and the shells of their body have scattered all over that place there, and some of them had come through the currents to her family in Manua. The sorcerers told the surviving sister, Sinai Senga, You will soon see new corals and shells arrive. Every time the currents and the matangi or wind from the east will blow through these shells, you will be reminded of Sinai Ofu before she was pushed off the cliffs. And from there, the story says, uh, Sinai Senga picked up this coral named the 4-4 and took it to her own family and started this ritual of wherever you hear this great sound, and it's a sacred sound. And it's a tapu. Every time you hear this sound, everybody should remember uh, Sina and her children, uh, the daughter and grandchildren of the, the Tuimanu of the Tangaloa. To this day, the 4 4 or conch shell continues to hold a special place in Samoan customs and rituals. For instance, around 5 30 or 6 pm each day, the sound of the 4 4 is heard throughout the country, signaling evening prayer and curfew. No one is allowed to leave their family homes until the 4-4 is sounded an hour or so after. The villagers are then allowed to roam around freely until the last sounding of the 4-4 for the night when it is blown at around 10.30 p.m., at which point everyone is expected to return to their homes and stay there until the sighting of a new day's dawn. The conch shell continues to be used as a signal for important meetings, not only in Samoa, but across all islands of the Pacific. If the conch shell is the kaitiaki or the custodian of formal occasions, then the drum is the messenger of excitement and urgency.
I guess if you see an event, just the sound of the drums, people will just, you know, they'll rush to it. Hey, what's going on? It gives you that goosebump, you know, knowing, oh, it attracts a lot. I guess that's why I created, you know, H. Taki is the center of the universe. It attracts everything. <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly. The drums, you know, the drums actually it attracts a lot of attention. Drum master, John Kiria. John hails from the center of the universe. That is, his universe, which is the island of Aitutaki in the Cook Islands. He is a respected advisor on Cook Island culture, particularly around the pate, or the wooden slit drum we heard just then. We'll hear more from him in a moment, but first, we go back to the beginning of time again, with Ma Aramaeva to hear the origin story of the pate and its sacred predecessor. The Ka'ara. The Ka'ara began in the mythologies of time. So there was the god Rongo. He had three sons. To those three sons, he gave different and varying baskets of knowledge. One of the sons, he gave a basket of knowledge relating to the sacred incantations. That's the prayers, the karakia, the recitals he gave to one of the sons. To another son, he gave the knowledge over food. That means how to ferment food, how to prepare, uh, preserve food, how to cook food. But I think most importantly, how to eat and enjoy food. To one of the sons, then he gifted the beauty of sounds, of music, which was actually the ka'ara, or the sacred drum. The ka'ara is a special drum that has a sort of like a figure eight opening, whereas the party would have just a parallel slit. Ka'ara comes from the word akara, which means to wake up, to awaken. So you can imagine from the sounds that it will awaken your spirit, it will awaken one. So it was then from the ka'ara, years later, or times later, that the ordinary party evolved, it developed from that sacred. Because that sacred ka'ara was not to be used in secular purposes. So the party really was, it came much later. The pate in Samoa is actually divided into two. The word pa, it means explode, the sound that it makes explode and when you hit something. And te is short for tea, and tea is the word for space or sound. And so, which is very much in reference with what you just shared. But now, for me, with the knowledge of the pate that you've just shared, now we know that it's widely used today, but we see widely used mostly in entertainment related. How much of the uh, purpose of the Ka'ara as it was gifted is still visible and practiced today uh, in, in Cook Island um, dealings when it comes to the spiritual realm and, and all of that? Well, about the use and practice of the Ka'ara, it's not being used. So for, for where the Ka'ara would have been used, it's just a party. That has taken over the purpose the personality of the ka'ara. So any sacred events, occasions, investiture of a paramount chief, this would be uh, used. And, and more importantly, this has been elevated to a missionary tool. Sunday mornings to call the flock to church, you know, it has shifted from the ka'ara now to the party. This is the caller that awakens the kind of the village to call to the church. Ma'ara Maeva on the story of the Cook Island Pate. Next, we learn about the various functions of the Pate with John Kiria. In my view, these instruments are our, 
how to say a Morse code or our mobile phones back in the days or our telegram to send messages to the next village or to those around what's taking place in that particular village. Like there's a special call for meetings. A special call when there's a wedding. A special drum beat for um, there is a funeral. There's a special drumming for where in the um, say like um, crowning a chief or a hariki. So there's there's various forms and various beats that does all that. Can you describe or name for me the various functions uh, and the use of the Pate in Cook Island traditions uh, covering all its 15 islands? In the Cook Islands, as as you know, it's split between the northern group and the southern group. I'll speak a little bit about the north. The north, they use the Pate, but they call it the Kōriro which is the smaller version of the normal party. And the, the sound and the tone of it is different as well. It's very high. And for the southern group, they have the the big party, which comes in different tones. The sound, how it's made, is there's various ways to tone the, the party so that it sounds the way you want it. Like, there's a, you know, just like a singing, like the opera kind of, there's a bass sound. Alto, you know, a tenor, so it's high, low, and a medium. When you see a lot of tourist groups, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone carries the flag. If you get lost, you can look for the color of the flag. And amongst a thousand noises, you can tell which group you belong to. And it's sort of uh, similar to having these different patterns. Does that mean if you come from a particular island or a particular village, there is a rhythm that you grow up hearing so that no matter where you are, when you hear it, Correct. you know it's, you know it's from that island or it's from that village. It's from that event or it's from that family. Like the beat Reu Reu, for example. If you hear we they know straight away it's a little, little beat. You know, it's the name the little, little, which is the name of a village. And then each village has its got its own beat that's been created after them or composed from that village. Another instrument commonly found throughout the Moana is one that is currently going through its second wave of revival right here in Aotearoa, the nose flute. In Te Ao Māori, or the Māori world, it is known as the nguru, one of the many taonga puoro, or traditional Māori instrument. In Tonga, it is called the whangu whangu, and in the Cook Islands, viva koe. But where can we say it originated? In the last segment of this podcast, we take a look at the unique origin stories and purposes of the nose flutes between two island nations, the Cook Islands with Ma'ara Maeva 
and Tonga with Professor Hufanga He Akomoilotu, Dr. Okositino Mahina. Our first origin story comes from Dr. Mahina, who is a foremost expert on the Tongan nose flute of Fangu Fangu. Raised in the ways of the Moana, specifically in the village of Tafisi and Tonga, Dr. Mahina is currently the Professor of Art, Culture and Critical Anthropology at the Tonga International Academy. So we are now talking about the Fangu Fangu and its oratory history or its origin uh, according to the Tongan custom. Hufanga, uh, can I ask, what is and what does the Tongan oral history say about the origin of the Fangu Fangu? Most, if not all things, came from Pulotu. Pulotu is the ancestral homeland and afterworld of Western Moana, formerly called Western Polynesia, and notably Samoa and Tonga, and of course Tuvalu, Tokelau, Niwe, including the Fangfangu and a, a range of art forms, house building, boat building, surfing, fishing, voyaging, navigation, you, you name it, they all came from from there, from uh, Pulotu, wh- which is in the land group in Fiji. Pulotu is an actual island lying to the north west of every inhabited island. That's where Pulotu is, an actual island, not imaginary island, or fictional island, it was an actual island. So the Fangfangu came from there. And I believe there are three, or maybe more, arts associated with the Fangfangu. Tufunga ngai Fangfangu, nose fruit making, Tufunga Takohi, the decoration, you know, the intersection of lines and spaces, and the playing of the fang fang. You know, they, they are basically the three art forms connected in this. The making of it, the decorating of it, the playing of it. And as you see, it's a stump of bamboo with holes in it, five on one side and one on the opposite side. And the way to uh, select, and only two holes are used to produce that four notes. And you have to block one nostril and play with the other. From the University of Auckland Pacific Sound Archives, that was a 1976 recording of the Honourable Lord Vihala giving a lecture on Fangu Fangu at the South Pacific Arts Festival in Rotorua. Vihala, who passed away in 1986, is widely recognised in Tonga as a nobleman and musician. His recordings begin the daily broadcast in Radio Tonga to this day. Now let's hear the origin story of the nose fluid in the Cook Islands, the Vivokoe, with Ma'ara Maeva. One of those mythologies mentioned a man called Ngaru. Ngaru basically means the ocean waves. It will become clear later on then it's a migration story. So Ngaru was a man of Mangaia. This guy, Ngaru, left Mangaia to explore and learn about other islands. He pulled up on his waka on the shores of a place called Taumakeva. He saw flowers, birds, sounds and views that was not on the island of Mangaia. That just tells us that it would have been an island far away from Mangaia. And it was there then that 
he got amongst the residents of that particular island, uh, Taumakeva, and amongst one of the many things that he learned from there was then the vivo koe. Musical instruments weren't a thing that Ngaru's island had, so we can assume that he was quite intrigued by the vivo koe, or bamboo nose flute. Uh, the nose flute, how it was played. More importantly, how it was made. Koe means the bamboo. So bamboo was one of the early plants that was gifted into the islands. So it was there in Taumakewa that he learned from the older folks how to make the vivo koe, the nose flute. And most importantly, it was there that he then learned, he was instructed from the House of Learning, the Sacred House of Learning in Taumakeva, how to actually play the vivo koe. It was then after those gifting that he then travelled back to the island of Mangaya, and it was him, Ngaru, who introduced knows a uh, flute playing uh, to Mangaya and evidently it spread uh, throughout the Cook Islands. So the nose flute originated in Taumakeba for the Cook Islands and Pulotu for Tonga. But what purposes did they serve in each region? We go back to Tonga for answers with Dr. Mahina. Can we talk about the utilization or the application of it in Tongan culture. What is its place? What was its place in Tongan society? Was it ceremonial, only for uh, reserved for a certain ceremony or a class of people? Or? It's musical, ceremonial, and cultural. All three, all of the above. And primarily, it is made as a musical instrument. Therefore, it is musical. It set the basis on which Tongan music and possibly Moana music across the whole region uh, to be predominantly Afo Fawaike or minor sound, you see. And it is also ceremonial uh, amongst uh, its ceremonial uses. The Fang Fang is used for putting people to sleep in uh, late evening or waking them up from their sleep early morning. Notably, members of, of the aristocracy and monarchy. So uh, it can be done solo or uh, as a group, you know, they will just move into the space and begin to to play gently, you know, the <laughs> and uh, early morning they sneak in and and um, and play again to gently wake him or her up from her or his sleep. So, uh, uh, in a deeper level, it is associated with the, the movement of body, mind and soul between two worlds. You know, the whole transformative effect and effect is so beautiful. You know, of of people moving between the worlds of the waking and the world of the sleeping. It's soothing, it's uh, therapeutic, it is uh, psychoanalytic, it is uh, hypnotic, you know. You hypnotize, in other words, you hypnotize a king with this enabling him or her to move from this world of constraints to a world of pure possibilities, the world of myth and dream. That's where everything is possible. If they say, go and fang fang with someone, 
You don't have to shout, you don't have to tap him on the shoulder. The Thomas is, they say, fangu fangu someone, get to the palm of his feet and give it a gentle little massage or tickling or little scratching. And that will wake him up or her gently. And that is the main purpose of the fang fang. It was used in the old days to wake the king up in the early morning. And that's the best time to listen to his nose flute in the early morning, just before dawn. And that's the time you hear the sweetest sound of this nose flute. Can you tell us about the piece of music you just played on the flute? Uh, the beginning and, and the end is what they call to uh, be by one of the uh, uh, species of uh, mutton bird. Oh, yes. That is usually in the uh, volcanic islands in Tonga and in some. This bird always gets up in the morning then start combing her feathers. Mm. And the first feather to drop on the ground, then one foot will pick it up and lament over it. Mm. And it's, that's an imitation of that uh, bird, the two. You heard Ve'ehala again at the 1976 South Pacific Arts Festival, followed by a recording of the same year, with Ve'ehala on Fangu Fangu and in conversation with New Zealand anthropologist Mervyn McLean. If the nose flute puts one to sleep in Tonga, what was its effect in the Cook Islands, I wonder? I put this question to Ma'ara Maeva. Are there any stories around the original purpose or the main purpose of the Viva Ko'e then in Taumakeva? or when he brought it back in uh, to the island of Mangaya, eventually growing out throughout the Cook Islands. In Talmakeva, what is known that as Ngaru learned the art of making the flute and playing the flute, as he was inducted into that realm upon or within the precinct of the sacred Marae, then we know straight away then that one of the purpose then of the vivo koe was a sacred instruction. In other words, the purpose of it was uh, to accompany uh, sacred rituals, to accompany the karakia, the chants. In other words, it was actually a wavelength to connect the mortals the peoples to the beyond. In other words, you might say, to the Atu, to the gods. So really it has a divine purpose. It's a, a, to associate sacred uh, prayers, uh, instructions on the Marae. So far, we've learned about the nose flute's sacred and formal use in traditions right across the Cook Islands in Tonga. But what about their use in the modern world? I asked for some final words from Dr. Mahina and Ma'ana Maeva. Is it uh, an art that needs electric shock? Uh, or is it uh, sitting there waiting to be utilized? Or um, it's non-existent? Where in those three potential scenarios is the fangu fangu in today? Great question. All of the above. And they boil down to mere ignorance. People are, are no longer knowledgeable of it. They are ignorant of its existence, of its beauty, of its depth and breadth. And uh, the negativity associated with it, because they 
think alongside the missionaries by condemning it as something to do with the devil or devil and therefore it is sinful therefore we need to uh, to reject it and, and, and not to adopt it anymore let's adopt the, the more after fog of the town the more major let sound that is uh, godly, heavenly. Uh, it's 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 appalling. How much of that original purpose, or the usage of Vivaco as it was, as the story tells, that is still evident and practiced today in the Cook Islands, or? the diasporic circles of our people as we leave our Hawaikis for to continue the migration, as we say? Well, that original purpose and usage, sadly enough, has diminished, if not lost. However, there are a few knowledge holders that have actually began to bring it back to where it was first gifted uh, to Ngaru. In other words, to bring it back onto the Marae. The last time I, I heard about this and I witnessed and I saw was in 2017. Before that, I have never seen it again. Until 2017, uh, there was this knowledge holder. He was a linguistics too. During the investiture, in other words, during the coronation of one of the paramount chiefs on Mauke, during that investiture or coronation, he blew, he sounded, this, this, uh, this knowledge holder played the nose flute on the sacred marae, on the sacred precinct as they were, as we understand, long time ago. It was during the Karakia, the sacred prayers, in bestowing the title onto this paramount chief. And it has actually given me um, an impetus, a purpose, that as I witnessed it back then, it ought not to be the last one for me and for the others, for others to, to, to leave it there, we should be uh, uh, reviving that sort of uh, music and music making and using of your traditional music instruments. As a Tangata Moana myself, we know that our earth and our identity are built around not just the look and the color and the feel of our islands, but so are the traditions through stories as well as the instruments we use to communicate. For after all, we created sounds that birthed our music. And I look forward to seeing more revival, not only of the Vivo Koe, but so are the other instruments that has been lost throughout time. That was the origin of sounds, the second of a two-part series of sounds of the Moana. For sounds sent off on New Zealand music, toi te arapuoro, pāwhetai tililawa, mālua upito, inaka wakalevu. Thank you for listening. This podcast was produced and presented by me, Tawiri Ili Alpha Mayaba. Co-produced by Sophie Yana Wilson. Sound engineered by Phil Brownlee. Research by me, Tawiri Ili Alpha Mayava. The script advisor was Kirsten Johnstone. And production assistance from Roger Smith, Kelly Mata, Nina Lesperanz, and Jonathan Engel. Thanks to executive producers Diana Marsh, Tiumalu Noma Sio Fayumu, and Leone Venta, without whom these podcasts would not have been made. Fafitai Telelava and deep gratitude to our esteemed guests, performers and knowledge holders, 
Ma Aramaeva, Leunga Ape Tawaana Ata Sofara, John Kiria, and Professor Hufanga He Akomailotu, Dr. Okositino Mahina. Nga mihi nui te wharewana ngō Tamakim Kaura o University of Auckland, Māori and Pacific Sound Archives, who kindly provided the majority of the recordings used in this podcast. For more about this podcast, other sounds podcasts, and information about the music of Aotearoa New Zealand, go to Sound's website, sounds.org.nz. That's S-O-U-N-Z. Soi fuaia ma ia manuia. No reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Toi te arapuru, sounds.